Welcome everyone to uh, this webinar on tradable energy quotas. My name is John Pfeffer. I'm the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus and Global Just Transition here at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC. And I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome this distinguished panel of presenters and our distinguished moderator as well, Jack Santa Barbara. I'm going to pass over all responsibilities to Jack in a moment after I introduce him. Jack is an environmental activist. He's a former CEO and academic, and he is joining us from New Zealand, which, as he pointed out earlier, is actually the future uh, because, of course, it's Wednesday morning in, in New Zealand, but probably metaphorically as well, New Zealand represents the future. At least we all hope so. Um, Jack, thank you for uh, helming our session today. Very good. Thank you, John, for organizing it all. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, today's webinar is about whether rationing fossil fuels can trigger a just transition to a just and sustainable future. We hope to explore the linkages between energy use, various existential crises we face, and the urgent need to establish a just and sustainable civilization. While texts have merits on their own, the question before us here is whether implementing texts could be the stimulus for transforming economies to more just and sustainable ways of living. So Sean Chamberlain will introduce us to the concept of tradable energy quotas. These are not to be confused with other fundamentally different tradable emission systems. Sean will tell us about their features and benefits from both a safe climate and social justice perspective. We'll then have comments from Ivan Yanez and Stan Cox in terms of tech potential to be a game changer in the common struggles that we face. Time will also be available for members of the audience to post questions to the speakers and make comments about the role that text could play from their perspective. Uh, the session is being recorded, uh, along with comments in the chat. So please put your comments that you'd like to share with uh, all participants into the chat. Uh, and these will be made available uh, in short order on the IPS website. Uh, if you would like to put a question to one of, or more of our speakers, please use the hand signal available at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll call upon you uh, in the latter part of the session. So those are the um, uh, some of the basics. And um, the issue now is to turn it over to Sean and uh, tell us about text. Thank you, Jack. Uh, so firstly, I will be endeavoring to not speak too quickly um, as a native English speaker and aware that not everyone here is. Um, if I fail in that, uh please um can, can everyone can everyone um post in the chat jack do you know am i able to see messages yes everyone should be able to post in the chat. Yeah. so if i um forget myself please post uh just slow down or something in the chat and i will endeavor to uh follow that advice um and i will now share my screen Uh, with due apologies to New Zealand for the past date. Um, so I added this tongue-in-cheek title to my presentation uh, when I saw some of the event promotion for this event describing it as the next step to save the world. And I think at this point in history we need to be clear about where we are. Um, saving the world means a lot of things to a lot of people, but for many I do think it means turning this civilization into something just and sustainable. Um, I want to be clear, I, don't, I think that goal is impossible. Um, I think it's undesirable uh, in that this is a civilization built on colonialism and exploitation and atomization and 
ecological devastation and the impossibility of endless economic growth. And frankly, I think as a goal, it's, it's, it's downright uninspiring. So from my perspective, the world as we've known it is ending. Um, unsustainable things end by definition. Uh, and so to me, the interesting questions are what the sequels look like, um, to what extent we do reach them via transition rather than collapse, uh, and how we bring greater justice to that already unfolding transformation. Um, and so as, uh, as Jack sort of hinted at, I want to start by mentioning carbon pricing because I think that um, the, the text name for those who aren't familiar with the system behind it, um, often conjures images of, uh, of carbon pricing. Um, I would say that, that carbon pricing is, is inherently colonial, actually, um, for a few reasons. Um, firstly, because we, we face a physical problem here. Um, we face a problem of physical substances being put into our into our atmosphere. And 90% plus of the responsibility for that physical problem is with the minority of people known as the global north. Um, and the, the bulk of the costs are falling on the majority of people known as the global south. And in that context, if we make money the control mechanism for dealing with this, then that clearly benefits the people who have more money and the countries who have more money. Um, what we need to recognize is that we're facing a physical problem uh, and we need to make the control mechanism one that deals with physical quantities. Now, we've all heard this term cap and trade, um, which sounds on the surface of it like, well, the cap part sounds good. Um, unfortunately, um, as I've explored with colleagues in peer reviewed work in the past, cap and trade almost invariably contains no meaningful, meaningful cap. It always has some form of safety valve mechanism, which basically means if the price gets out of hand, we'll ignore the cap. Um, and so the solutions that, mm, the solutions that are being put forward are not even addressing the real problem. And they also leave us with a linguistic problem because we're used to using the words cap about systems that don't contain a meaningful cap, which leaves us with no good language for talking about systems that do have a meaningful cap, that's an aside. Um, so what's the alternative? Well, the inventor of Hex, tradable energy quotas, my late friend and mentor, Dr. David Fleming. This is the line of his that most changed my life. Uh, when I met him nearly 20 years ago now, I was thinking, ah, I, I need to get involved with the United Nations processes with these big scale attempts to address the, the climate issue, which I was campaigning on back then. And this line from David brought me up short. Large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework or indeed large scale frameworks. And the more I've engaged with that concept, the more transformative it's been for me. It's, it's people who actually have real relationships with their, their land and their lives and their, their realities on the ground. Uh, that have the knowledge and the skills and the ability to transform. Um, and of course, we're used to thinking of the global as being big and the local as being small. But of course, the local is just as big as the global and the local is everywhere. Um, and so local solutions don't necessarily mean small in terms of their impact. And that's where the large scale frameworks come in, creating the frameworks which enable all the individual bits of change at the small scale, all the diverse and appropriate kinds of change that are needed um, into some kind of collective framework for large scale change. So top down systems 
can't help with this kind of problem, even if they're incredibly clever, even if they're incredibly well-intentioned. Um, what we need is frameworks that support and enable bottom-up diversity. Um, but of course, the response you always get when talking in those terms is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all very nice, but let's be realistic. You know, what we're dealing with here is like a huge global problem. And I think realistic is a really interesting term in this context. Um, oops. So Stan, who's on our panel now, uh, tweeted this the other day to promote this event, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and he's, he's absolutely right. In, in around 2010, uh, the government here in the UK conducted a, a big feasibility study into the tech system. Uh, and their conclusion was that it, it was ahead of its time. Um, now, as Stan says, I mean, in one sense, they were completely wrong. <laughs> that would have been exactly the right time for the UK, which leads the world, if that's the right term, in historical per capita emissions, um, to start radically reducing those emissions. Um, but in another sense, the government were right, but they were right with regard to a different reality. Um, Stan is absolutely right with regard to physical reality and consequences. The government were in a sense right with regard to social reality and political reality, which I think is what they were referring to when they said it was ahead of its time. Um, people aren't ready for this. You know, the, the, the public are not going to vote for uh, limiting growth. Uh, and so in many ways, the problem, as I see it at least, or one element of the problem, is this rift in realism between sort of physical reality and political reality. Um, and that explains to some extent why it's such a challenge to get agreement over something that seems so obvious as um, sustaining a, a beneficent climate. Um, so what is tech in this context? Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna discuss what text would deliver, how it works and why it doesn't exist yet. And what text delivers firstly is an actual guarantee that carbon budgets are delivered on. Um, and this is something which I think frightens governments, actually. Um, I think that governments have quite rightly diagnosed that what the voters want from them is to, and I talk here about the Global North primarily, is to be told that climate change is being addressed by these great global agreements and not be asked to have any difficult changes to their lives because of that. Um, and that's what governments have been delivering very effectively. Um, so here in the UK, as our government never tires of telling us, we've been, quote, leading the world in uh, carbon budgets. Um, back in, I think it was 2010, we had our Climate Change Act that said we would reduce emissions in the UK by 80% by 2050, which in terms of political reality does lead the world, in terms of physical reality even then was clearly insufficient. Um, but what we don't have and don't look to have anytime soon is any reasonable plan for actually delivering on the targets that we have. Um, we have a climate change committee which regularly puts out reports saying, uh, actually, we're nowhere near on target delivering on what the government's le promised legally binding targets to deliver. Um, and so the first thing that tax would deliver is essentially calling government's bluff. Um, all that tax does is deliver a straightforward means to actually reduce emissions in line with government targets, rather than the whole mess of carbon trading. So that's the first thing, an actual guarantee of delivering. The second thing is ensuring fair access to fuel and energy within that, that budget, which is obviously critical, both for humanitarian reasons and because if it doesn't happen, the, the budget is going to be abandoned soon enough. And thirdly, and, and critically, in the context of that quote I shared five minutes ago, it's about empowering communities 
and building a sense of common purpose, building a sense that we all together are pulling together to A, keep energy affordable and available and B, sustain a, a, a livable climate, a beneficent climate, both of which are clearly goals that people can uh, collectively get behind. Ow. Well, firstly, by adopting a different paradigm to the, the whole carbon pricing approach, um, there's this sort of fundamental impossible tension, as I see it, um, within mainstream climate policy, which is that it's all about carbon prices. We need to make carbon sufficiently expensive that it gets driven out of the economy. Um, but at the same time, we need to keep energy affordable. Now, the most recent International Energy Agency report revealed that 90% of global energy, 75% of electricity, still comes from fossil fuels. So if our energy is so highly carbonized, it becomes, unsurprisingly, incredibly difficult to raise the price of carbon without raising the price of energy. Um, and so we end up with this, this incredible tension between these two seemingly desirable imperatives to keep energy affordable and carbon expensive. And I would say this has been a brilliant move on the part of the fossil fuel companies. Um, prioritizing carbon pricing as the approach to dealing with our physical problem of destabilization of our climate has made environmental concerns seem to be in direct opposition to the interests of the poor in society. Um, and unsurprisingly has tied up campaigners and governments in all sorts of disastrous political compromises in attempting to, to deal with this impossible bind. And so what Tex would do is turn that on its head, um, make the economy exist within a carbon budget rather than the other way around. Um, unify everybody in this common purpose around genuine shared goals, keeping energy, energy services available and affordable, and minimizing the destabilization of our climate. Uh, and I'll, by now you're probably keen to hear more about how Tex would do all of these miraculous things, um, but just give me one more slide before we get into the, the nuts and bolts, um, which is on the political process, because this is not just um, some pie in the sky idea. This is something that we've taken quite a long way through politics. Um, so to give you some context on that before getting into the nuts and bolts, the details. Um, the tech system was first published on by my late mentor, David Fleming back in 1996. Um, the first government funded research into the system was in 2006, 10 years later. Uh, in 2008, uh, we had the aforementioned Climate Change Act um, and the government funded a full feasibility study into the tech system, which I was an advisor to at the time. Um, and as mentioned, the conclusion was that it's ahead of its time uh, and that they were going to focus on what they call international abatement. So in other words, rather than actually reducing UK emissions, they were going to uh, pay other people to reduce them on their behalf um, because that was more economically efficient which comes back to what I said at the start, that as soon as we make money, the control mechanism for addressing this physical problem, um, rich people and rich countries can buy their way out of it with money. Uh, in 2008, the same year, the Parliamentary Environmental Audit Committee, which is the official body that reviews Parliament's um, proceedings, uh, were incredibly critical of this conclusion and said that the government should be looking at this much more strictly and um, pushing forward towards implementation. They were completely ignored. Um, in 2011, uh, the all-party parliamentary group um, published another report which um, gained a great deal of international media coverage, um, was you know, endorsed by a lot of high-profile people, uh, and again, was completely ignored, essentially, by the uh, government. Uh, the European Environmental Bureau picked it up in 2013. Um, that peer review paper I mentioned earlier was published in Kevin Anderson's magazine, uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, the climate scientist, um, on radical, redu radical emissions reductions in 2015. And in 2018, there was a European Commission debate uh, around the system, but essentially, 
for all of that, um, it has not reached implementation. And I'll say a little more at the end about my experiences of going through that political process and uh, why I think we didn't see uh, anything real at the end of all this work. Um, of course, in 2023, um, there is a lot more awareness of uh, the consequences of simply kicking climate emissions as an issue down the road. Uh, and so um, Stan and I have been talking about how much more interest we're seeing recently in the concept of, of rationing, um, which is essentially what tax is. So all of that said, hopefully I've got you interested enough to want to know how the system would actually function in detail. Um, so tradable energy quotas, TEQs, tax, is an electronic system for capping carbon rated energy use at the national level for all energy users. So this is not um, just for companies, this is not just for individuals, this is for governments, for farmers, for anybody within the economy who uses energy. In order to get that energy, they will have to engage with the tech system. And I'll be explaining these terms as we go through the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a national system for, for implementing national uh, carbon commitments agreed by the government of that country. Um, and all individuals within that country receive an unconditional, equal and free entitlement of what are called tax units, which you might think of as electronic ration coupons, if you like. Um, and so to purchase any fuel or energy anywhere in the economy, uh, these units have to be surrendered alongside the usual payment of money. So you go to the gas station, you pay in cash or by credit card or whatever, and alongside that you surrender some of these tax units. And we can talk about the practicalities of doing that if people are interested. Um, and then if you, so your, your entitlement will be a, an equal proportion of the, of the national carbon budget. Um, if you use less than that, so if you're a below average energy user, then you'll have some spare left from your entitlement, which you receive each week. And uh, you can sell that spare. Um, so those who are energy thrifty get a financial benefit from using less. Um, those who want to use more than their entitlement can buy those spare units. Um, but of course, they're then effectively paying the uh, the more energy thrifty people for the benefit of doing so. So um, while at present the, the richer people can buy as much energy as they want, um, this makes it a, a fairer arrangement. Um, so this is a, a big and complex diagram, which I won't expect you to understand now, but just to give you a sense of what we're going to build up, we're going to go through this stage by stage. So it begins with, in the UK at least, the Committee on Climate Change. Um, and this is the body which sets our national carbon budget. This exists now. Uh, it didn't exist when X was first conceived, but it now does. Um, and this is semi-independent of government in the UK, but whichever body it is in the country, um, that country sets the carbon budget, obviously in negotiation with other countries around the world as part of, uh, as part of an ongoing process. And, that's a whole other conversation, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but what tax does is implement the country's national budget. Um, so as I mentioned, this budget establishes the, the total number of tax units, the total amount of carbon that can be, that can be emitted in the country. And oops, I've got my uh, slide, I just took my own slide. Um, and critically, um, because we know that uh, energy can only be used in, in alignment with this, um, with the issuance of these units. It provides this, this guarantee, this long-term confidence that we, the carbon budget is actually going to be respected. Um, it's not like the current situation where a government sets ambitious targets and then 10, 15 years later says, ah, well, oops, we didn't quite get that. Um, under this circumstance, it's actually a, a binding constraint on the economy and consequently the all the actors in the economy, all the people, all the companies know that they can act with confidence that actually decarbonizing is gonna be worth it and isn't going to be left high and dry. 
slide there we go um and then the registrar what we often call quota co um is the body which issues these uh these tax units into the economy um and so the entitlement is what i mentioned earlier so in the uk around 40 percent of emissions come from individuals and households and around 60 percent of emissions come from uh, industry and companies and, and non-household energy users. Uh, so in line with those proportions, 40% uh, of the budget goes to individuals, and that's the entitlement that I mentioned earlier. The 60% goes via this tender, which is essentially an auction um, to all other users. Um, and yeah, in that way, so it's only, it's only individuals and households that get the free tax units. Um, all other energy users need to purchase the units that they need. Uh, and this sets a, a price, um, a single national price. So the only place that anybody can get their tax units is from the registrar protocol. There's no, there's no trading between you and your neighbor directly. If you want to sell some units, you sell them to the registrar. If they want to buy some units, they buy them from the registrar. So there's nothing any more complex to engage with than popping up a mobile phone, for example, you just you just top it up at the at the relevant price today, which is a single price across the whole country. And the other sort of core concept that we need to understand is the rating system. And what the rating system is, is the equivalence between uh, the carbon budget and the actual amounts of fuel or energy that people are purchasing. Um, so, for example, one tax unit is one kilogram of, of CO2 or the equivalent global warming potential uh, of other gases. Um, and so each energy retailer in the country um, will be assessed by the government for the carbon intensity of its um, of its fuel. Um, and. Uh, and so what that means is that if, um, for example, one oil company um, has a more carbon efficient refining process than another, then their oil, their um, gasoline, their petrol will require fewer tax units from the consumer at the point of purchase. So it creates an incentive all the way through the economy um for lower carbon processes but of course relative to any oil producer uh re renewable energy is going to require vastly fewer tax units not none because there is still fossil fuel used in the production of wind turbines for example or solar panels um but vastly vastly fewer um and so again there's a huge advantage to um renewable producers and critically there's no need for um the impossibilities, frankly, of sort of carbon labeling every product and service in the economy. Um, we don't need to figure out how much carbon went into every bag of crisps, for example. Um, you only need to surrender tax units at the point of purchase of fuel or energy. Um, and so a relatively smaller, a manageable number of fuel and energy sources are there to be, to be assessed in this way. Um, and there's no need to sort of measure measure the emissions that come out of every chimney or every every car exhaust pipe or whatever um, because we know we've we've captured all the the rating system applies upstream as it were um, but people engage with it downstream um, I'm going to skip over that because I don't have that much time um, so then at any point um, people can go to the registrar and they can look to purchase more tax units if they Feel that they need them and at any point people can sell um, and so the price at any given time is determined by um, because the quantity is fixed by the carbon budget it's determined by the demand um, so depending if there are lots of people who are really struggling to live under the carbon budget um, there are going to be lots of people trying to buy tax units and so the price is going to go up and so it creates this very clear message to the whole society to say um, okay, we're not adapting very well under the budget. Um, and it creates a real common purpose, a real political momentum 
behind anything that's going to improve the decarbonisation of the economy and so bring that price down for everyone. For everyone. Um, and equally, oops, equally, if uh, if the price is dropping, that's something that just about everybody's going to welcome. Um, so everybody has access to units at the same price at any time. The national price fluctuates in line with national demand because supply is fixed by the budget. And buying and selling is very straightforward. There's no sort of eBay of, uh, of tax units or anything complicated like that. Uh, interestingly, you see that little pound symbol in the bottom left, could be a dollar or a euro or whatever other currency. Um, it, this generates some money because the tender is, is selling tax units into the economy. So the government is receiving income from this. And uh, the idea is that that is a fund that is restricted for just these purposes. So if people are really struggling with um, fuel prices, for example, for transportation, that fund could be used to fund um, major infrastructural changes. Um, for example, new public transport systems or, or insulation projects or whatever it may be, the kinds of changes that aren't really available to individuals, um, but can be implemented at the, at the national scale. Um, tax would generate funding for that. And then in terms of the uh, sort of integrity of the system, um, so units then flow through the energy cycle, as we say. Um, so on the left-hand side of this diagram, we've got the, the issuing of those units into the economy. Uh, and then people spend them, well, use them. They, they buy fuel and electricity, surrender their units at the time of doing so. And so then those tax units flow to the fuel and electricity retailers. Um, they in turn have to surrender them to the person, the company probably that they buy their fuel from. So the petrol station where you buy your, your gasoline, uh, when they buy their fuel from, from their suppliers or from the drillers or the extractors or the importers, um, they have to surrender units. And no matter whether that's all integrated into one company or whether it's 20 companies along the line, eventually those units end up with the, the people who are bringing the energy into the economy, whether they're sort of extracting it within the national borders or whether they're importing it. Um, and they, in order to have their license to operate, have to surrender those units back to the registrar, back to Quotico. And so you've got a, a circular system. Um, and the beauty of that is that it means there isn't a need for um, government surveillance of the system. There isn't a need for government to check that this is taking place everywhere. Um, you know, for example, if I work at the petrol station um, and my brother comes in to buy some units, and I say, oh, don't worry, I'll let you off paying with your tax units today. Uh, then he, then I, don't, I, as the petrol station owner, don't receive those units. And so I have none to pass on up the chain. And so I have to buy them myself. And so just as with cash, there's no need for the government to check on every transaction to make sure that cash has changed hands. The same applies to tax. And so it becomes a very, a very straightforward system. It can be done as part of existing transactions. If people don't have a credit card or anything like that, um, it can just be done as cash. You, you buy your fuel in cash and the, the retailer adds on the cost of the tax units at the current price, all as part of, of one transaction. Um, and, and I think there's, um, there, are, there are real questions about uh, what something like this would look like in the global south um, or in some parts of the global south where there's much less sort of electronic infrastructure. Um, I wouldn't really be able to speak to that. That's, that's not really my area of expertise, but more importantly, that isn't where the problem is. The problem is with the consumption and the emissions in the global north. Um, and this is a, a proposal for the global north to, to address that. So that's the whole system. That's how it works. That's the whole of it. Um, the, the benefits, it provides the guarantee. It provides this clear long-term signal. It leaves money with people. It's not taking money from people in the way that, that taxation does. It's actually, um, improving their situation. It's progressive. It's been shown many, many times to be greatly to the benefit of the poorer in society because they tend to use less energy. Provides us assured entitlement to energy for all. It's specified in terms of energy, not in terms of money, as we discussed at the start. It addresses fuel scarcity as well as um, climate. 
Uh, it's hands-free in the sense that it's it's not something that's cumbersome and difficult for, for ordinary people to deal with, but it's still um, something they'll be very aware of in their day-to-day -day lives. It means that the government becomes here to help. It's it's the government is itself bound by the system and uh, is there to help the nation in in transitioning within that system rather than being imposing some kind of taxation system. It provides this new paradigm, as I spoke about earlier offers moral leadership to the nation that actually takes this on, says we will actually achieve our, our climate change targets. So what are you doing? And as I say, it creates this sense of common purpose in the nation around these shared goals. Um, and interestingly, carbon pricing does none of those things. Carbon pricing has, offers no guarantee, no clear long-term signal, takes money from people, is regressive, offers no assured entitlement, et cetera. Um, maybe I'll skip this slide because I'm, I'm out of time, but there's a question mark about the senses in which this is rationing and the senses of which it isn't. If people want to talk about that, then um, we can in the Q&A. Uh, I just wanted to highlight this that came out last week, um, the Port Vila call for a just transition to a fossil fuel free Pacific. It's one of many calls that we see for, to quote the, uh, the call out unqualified, equitable, global phase out of fossil fuel production in line with 1.5 degrees C. And this to me is the call of physical reality against political reality in the global north. This is the call that says, yes, this sounds radical and overambitious in terms of our social and political reality, but this is the physical reality that we really need to have much greater um, much greater respect for, because if political and physical reality do not reconcile, physical reality is the one that's gonna pull rank. It's gonna, it's gonna win that argument, if you like. Um, again, a quick reminder that this is something that's been through this, this long political process already, and it's something that we actually got pretty close to seeing implemented right up to the point where essentially the, the UK Treasury um, looked at the system and essentially recognized that it was a threat to economic growth. Um, and that is why, as someone who was relatively close to the process, speaking, you know, not in any official capacity, but in, based on my experience of what unfolded, that's what happened. Uh, essentially, they looked at this and went, ah, oh, that's all very nice, but actually we'd much rather just continue emitting and not deal with the question of economic growth. So we're going to kick this into the long grass um, for now. And so finally, I think my key learnings from this um, experience of, of working around this tech system for, for nearly 20 years now, um, is that if we do again create a movement around this, if we do again get this to anywhere close to political implementation, then I think what we're going to face again um, is a determination to undermine it. Um, you know, let's imagine that there was a global campaign for techs over the next five years and irresistible political momentum, then there would come a point at which the people within some government department or corporate think tank would say, yeah, that's fine, but, you know, we, we just need to put in this little safety valve just to make sure that prices don't get too high. And it'll be something that only the, the wonkish techie people even understand what they mean by that. But it will be all too easy to see something implemented under the name of text or the name of rationing, which actually isn't. Um, and to, cha to channel all of that political um, momentum into something that just maintains the status quo. So for me, that's a real challenge is how, how can we defend key facets of the policy as it gets closer to political reality? Um, and yeah, ultimately respect ecological limits rather than respecting economic growth fundamentally. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, to end, I would just like to quote um, a hero of mine, the climate scientist, Kevin Anderson, um, or to paraphrase him at least, he said that uh, if the mainstream option is altering the composition of the atmosphere to the point where it doesn't support complex life, then you are welcome to consider me a radical. Um, and I think that's something that I often I often think about when when challenged on the uh, realism of such proposals. Um, so I much look forward to the conversation with the panel and with everyone else. And uh, thank you, Jack, for letting me run over a little.
Terrific. Thank you very much, Sean, for a uh, very straightforward and simple um, <clears throat> explanation of a, a very important uh, mechanism. Uh, before we return to uh, Yvonne and Stan for some comments, I wonder if you could just briefly say something about the importance of the declining quotas over time and, and how important that is for building the community uh, spirit and, and that we're all in the same storm um, idea. Sorry, Jack, was that addressed to me? I was distracted. By the yes, Sean, yeah. if you could just... Uh, Say something about the importance of the declining quotas. Some of the questions yeah. that have come, in, uh, I think, would, would, it would address them. Yeah, great. That's what I was just looking at. Um, so, uh, so yes, the very essence of the system, of course, is that the carbon budget goes down step by step, uh, year on year, as of course any any sensible carbon budget must. Um, and so, the real question then becomes. How do we adapt within that? I mean, I think there's been such a focus on, and, and rightly so, on um, agreeing globally uh, appropriate carbon budgets um, that are sufficiently steep to address the problem, um, but also not so demanding that they, that they destroy economies and lives. Um, so it's very appropriate that there's been a huge focus on that, but there's been so little focus on the parallel question of how do we actually do this? How do, how do we actually reduce global north emissions by, I don't know, 90% in 20 years or, or whatever we consider to be um, radical, radical emissions reductions? Um, and so, yes, really the essence of this is, is, as I mentioned, to create that sense of common purpose in a nation um, around, around that, that, that sort of mission um, that that shared objective of adapting as um, as rapidly as we can, because that's what, frankly, sanity demands. Um, but also recognizing that, of course, it it can be a, a painful process to uh, decarbonize at the rates that we've made necessary by our inaction over recent decades. Um, and so, yes, it's all about how do we reduce the carbon budget as quickly as possible whilst minimizing the um, the pain of that. Great, thank you very much for that additional clarification. Fun, we would like to hear from you um, in terms of your reaction to this idea of text and the potential role they might play in stimulating uh, sort of transformative change that I think many of us feel are needed. Over to you, Yvonne, you're, you're on mute. So you unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I have uh, five, 10 minutes, no more than that. Okay, thank you five, very five much. Five to 10 minutes, yes. Sorry? Five, five to 10 minutes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. And thank you, Sean, for your presentation. Uh, and sorry for my English. It's very Baroque and abstract. So I guess that you will understand what I want to say. Um, I, I was reading the documentation that I found about uh, TE text and what you wrote and together also with David Fleming. And uh, also listening to you now, I have a lot of doubts. <laughs> I have a lot of questions that uh, I would like to share. I mean, maybe they are useful, maybe not. And I am going to talk from a geographical uh, and cultural point of view from, and political point of view uh, from Ecuador, no, a southern country, from Acción Ecológica, which is a well-known organization that uh, works on climate change since more than 20 years. And also from a country and from an organization that have been pushing since more than 20 years ago, the idea to leave fossil fuels on the ground. And for us, this is the most important premise that we have to take in account uh, in order to define any policy regarding 
CO2 reductions or regarding energy or regarding any transformation or transition. So this is the basis that I would like to start talking uh, about. The second thing, and these are the, 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 the main doubts that, uh, that I had reading and listening to you, Sean, that I would like to share too, has to do with um, some uh, ideas related with text. For example, the first one is that you talk about a certain climate budget, okay? So I don't like this idea of the carbon budget at all <laughs> since many years ago, because first of all, the budget is set by who? In this case, this commission in the UK, for example. The budget takes in count what supposedly all the planet still has in order to absorb CO2 emissions. But it doesn't take in count that the absorption and the, and the carbons are completely different if we talk about fossil fuel carbon and if we talk about natural carbon that is up, uh, above uh, in, in the planet. And also, it doesn't take in account the historical occupation of the atmosphere since 150 or more years ago that occupied already one part of this huge, in quotes, budget that has the planet. So it, it do doesn't take in account the ecological debt, the climate debt that already exists. So the carbon budget in this case is calculated Cal calculated with the, uh, from this organization at, uh, regarding something that is unfair historically and that is based on what? I mean, the UK, the commission in the UK say, okay, we have this carbon budget. That means that you are taking in account the current consumption of energy in the UK or you are taking in account the 50 less percent energy that should consume the UK if we want to talk about you know the recommendations that we have to save on energy if we want to fight climate change or how do you calculate this budget so there are different problems regarding this concept the other thing is uh, that I was reading also in the documents and that you didn't mention but I am worried about is is this idea of who is going to buy the, the excedent that some people, person, citizens do not use? The companies, the tenders, as you put in your slides, are the ones that can buy this excedent of, of uh, tax. According to what? Because they need these excedents to achieve their necessities of energy consumption of what they are already consuming, what they think that they are going to consume, like the tricky of the carbon offsets, or they are going to buy, I mean, what for? So, and I really think that this idea to buy and sell and the, and the polluters can, can buy, this can lead not to a reducing of any, any uh, carbon emissions, but probably it will lead to augmentate <laughs> the carbon emissions because we don't know what they are going to say that is a need for them. So this is something that also is, for me, complicated. The other thing that I, I think that probably is, is also a problem is that, and maybe I don't understand very well exactly what this is about, uh, is, is regarding the tax, uh, the quota that you have is to but to consume um, fuels for transportation, energy for your household. I, I think that this is the two things that you mentioned. But what happened, for example, I know that in UK and in Europe and France and in Spain, I don't know, much part of the heating in the houses do not come from fossil fuels, come from biomass. So in this case, are you considering also this? I mean that you're going to have a quota of, of a budget, carbon budget. Uh, I mean, 
with uh, to do something that is completely absurd that is to buy forests to heat your house i mean i i think that there are some things that have been considering of what we are talking about this text if it is fossil fuels or other energies too and also i was reading in the documents that um, for example, if you are a company that do these geoengineering bags or anything that is uh, carbon capture, storage, etc., can have free entitlements. <laughs> I mean, for because because it's supposedly good for um, for uh, the planet and to fight climate change. We, we know that this is completely false because they this means that they are going to continue extracting fossil fuels and who knows what, what other problems are going to cause. So I think that we have to also to discuss these companies, the BEX and geoengineering companies, et cetera, and also the renewable energy companies that are causing so much problems in the planet are also going to have free entitlements or what is the relation with this, with these companies? And finally, I, I want Sorry, to- Sorry, Yvonne, could yeah. you just repeat that last point? Who will have- I read in one of the documents- um, Just the very last sentence that you said. Ah, uh, you, you, talked, you talked about that convex, um, um, but then I, I just- missed... Yeah, what I, what I meant is that uh, uh, companies like uh, those that are um, wants to do geoengineering, like the BEX, you know, but also the renewable energy companies that are causing so much problems uh, in the planet, according to with some of the documents that I read, could be considered uh, receptors of free entitlements of tax too. So, no, but okay. So, so I, it's a question <laughs> in this case. And if it is not, it's good, but I would like to, to listen from you. And I am going to finish with my last intervention is that um, I think that uh, one, one, one big problem that uh, can have the tax and the implementation and, and as a part of the solution to climate change is that it focus uh, again, too much on carbon, on molecules, and not necessarily in tons of coal, in square meters of gas, barrels of oil, and I mean, in terms of energy itself. I know that Larry Lohman, that I know that is here, probably will have an opinion about energy, et cetera. But I think that the text or, or the proposal should be okay. It is not a question of carbon budget, but is a question of energy. Here, you cannot consume more ener energy than this. I mean, in, in joules or or in barrels of oil or in in, in gallons gallons of uh, fuel. I don't know. So to to shift the idea of the carbon and to put it in fossil fuels quantity. So I think that this could be you know another option. And thank you very much. I hope that it was clear. <laughs> if not, I can repeat or clarify anything. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne, for, for very um, well-informed and, and important points that you, you've raised. Um, I wonder if it would be helpful to have Stan make his comments as well before asking you to respond, Sean. Uh, so I mean, my, my instinct would be to respond and then bring in Stan, but I'm happy to- Okay, if you, you if you prefer that, uh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Chuck. Um, so yeah, basically, Yvonne, I'm just in agreement with almost all that you said, actually. Um, like, I agree that the priority is leaving fossil fuels in the ground, absolutely. Um, and, uh, which was your first point. And so then for me, the question became, okay, so how do we get that to happen? Well, the first thing we need to do is one of the things we need to do <clears throat> is work out how to uh, make that feasible. Make make it, have have people in the global north learn to live without um, using as much energy as they do. Um, and in res and as your last point was, we absolutely need to move from talking about. Um, carbon to talking about energy specifically, and maybe I didn't um, 
give enough uh, emphasis to this in my presentation, but if I um, pull it up again now um, and zip back to the rating system, um, that's, that's exactly um, what techs are for. Um, so here uh, you can see that basically we take a kilogram of CO2 um, and we convert that into a unit. So for example, um, you know, one liter of oil or one metric cube of, of gas or one kilowatt of electricity. Um, and that's why these are called tradable energy quotas, not, not, not carbon quotas, um, because what they are about is saying, how can we reduce the energy use of the global north so that we pull less fossil fuels out of the ground? Um, so yes, absolutely. I'm on the same page, I believe, as you on that. Um, in terms of the carbon budget, um, yes, I absolutely agree with everything that you said. Um, the, uh, the global negotiations around, um, well, firstly, I agree that the idea of a carbon budget is itself problematic. Um, to my point of view, there is no acceptable carbon budget left to burn. We're already at a point where the climate has been destabilized and is having profoundly undesirable effects. Um, and so again, I, I, as I see it, we're torn between this, the, the physical reality and the political reality. Um, like if I could click my fingers and, and transform both of those, I, I would. Um, but the reason why countries aren't willing to say, yes, we'll just stop emitting carbon tomorrow is because their whole economies are dependent on 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 that on the fuel that contains that carbon, um, and hence we've got this huge and very dysfunctional United Nations process um, of of countries trying to negotiate amongst themselves about uh, what would be an appropriate carbon budget taken in, into consideration historic responsibilities. That is something I'm also very interested in. But really, it, it's not what Tex addresses. Tex is purely, once that process has set some kind of national carbon budget for a country, Tex is the means to achieve that budget. Um, so I, I, I would agree that, that carbon budgets may not be the right way of do, dealing with that. But Tex, um, Tex offers no help with the process of figuring out which nations should reduce how fast. All it does is produce, is offer the means for reducing energy use in a nation as quickly as, as possible. Um, now, uh, with regard to um, BEX and, and uh, geoengineering, again, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I've, I've never heard anyone suggest that renewable companies should get free tax units. That's, yeah, not something I've ever heard of and is not the case. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, biomass uh, heating in homes um, is a very interesting one. Um, it's certainly uh, a concern that um, if you via tax make it much more difficult for people to get hold of um, fossil based energy, then they might just start cutting down their local forests to, to heat their homes. Um, and that, that would certainly be problematic. But I think that this is based on the idea that um, tax would make energy more expensive. And again, I think this is the, this is the critical paradigm. I feel like um, maybe I haven't, I haven't sort of communicated this sufficiently, um, that the, the idea of tax is not that it increases the price of energy or carbon and so reduces usage. Like that is the carbon pricing paradigm. That is not what Tex is trying to do. Uh, Tex is saying, we have collectively agreed that we are going to reduce our carbon usage as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we convert that carbon budget into energy, as you say, and then we work out collectively as a country, how can we reduce our energy usage as much as possible? Um, and so you were talking about who buys. Um, if people, if I don't use my full quota, who's going to buy that? And maybe it'll be a fossil fuel company. That's true. It might, um, but that doesn't in any way 
inc make it more possible for them to emit above the cap. The national cap is, is set and the quotas are issued into the economy in line with that cap. And whether those um, fuels are burned by me or by a fossil fuel company, that doesn't affect the cap. Again, the, the critical thing is that the price is, is irrelevant to how much energy is used. Um, the energy is rationed rather than, rather than priced. Um, so, uh, so if a fossil fuel company does continue to um, burn profligately, that's a word, burn uh, excessively, then um, it will cost them more and more and more and more and more to do that. And eventually they won't be able to do that because they will, they will run, into, um, run into the cap. Uh, and just to, sorry, I got sort of combined two answers there, just to finish addressing the, um, the biomass question. Um, because uh, the tax system will make poorer households better off um, and guarantee basic entitlements to energy for those who might otherwise be priced out of the energy market, um, I would argue that it's, it's more likely to um, encourage the, the, the preservation of, um, well, woodlands and other valuable potential sources of, of biomass um, because the threat to them comes not from from tax, but from the idea of the um, extreme uh, climate problems and uh, extreme increases in price that would be caused by an unmitigated energy market by sort of you know capitalism that isn't restrained within a within a capping system like tax. Um, so yeah, I think in 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 short, I. Uh, I think I agree with almost everything you said, Yvonne, but I don't know whether you, you agree that we agree. I <laughs> think you might not. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sean. Okay, Stan, the opportunity for you, if you could unmute yourself and uh, look forward to your, your comments and reactions. Um, yes, and, and thank you, Sean and Yvonne for <clears throat> doing a lot of the work uh, for me here, and but um, and and so I, I'm able to kind of <clears throat> go into maybe some more of the context, and especially this question of what what could make uh, these kind of uh, systems more politically um, you know, uh, popular, or if not popular, at, at least um, acceptable. <clears throat> Um, and I, you know, I would argue that tax and other cap and ration systems have solid potential to gain broad, broad political acceptance if it's clear that the majority in society under these systems would have guaranteed access to affordable energy to meet their needs and with uh, greater economic security than they may even have today. And when I say other cap and ration systems, I include one uh, that's uh, been put forth by Larry Edwards and me, has very similar objectives to tax. Uh, but as uh, Yvonne suggests, um, the caps and the rations are in terms of uh, barrels of oil, cubic meters of gas, tons of coal, um, in, in rather than uh, carbon units, but uh, otherwise they, uh, they're very parallel. And I think the chief thing to make clear to the public is that these proposals for rapidly phasing out carbon emissions and fossil fuels while ensuring sufficiency and fairness include two necessary parts. And um, as Sean stressed earlier, the cap is, and, and Yvonne, the cap is, and the declining cap is the big thing on uh, the total of national emissions ratcheted down year by year. Um, and then everything else I would uh, put in the, um, under the heading of policies for adapting to the declining supply of fuels in a way that ensures sufficiency equity and justice for all. These policies would include, at a minimum, um, careful allocation of energy among economic sectors and fair shares rationing for 
consumers as um, you know, techs and, and, and our system do. Um, techs would go a long way toward ensuring this uh, sufficiency and fairness, and it's crucial that society understand this, that people not be under the mistaken impression, one that's unfortunately widespread in the wider world, that it's rationing that uh, puts the burden of emissions reductions on individuals and households by limiting their consumption. But on the contrary, it's the declining cap that um, ensures the reductions in total emissions. The fair shares rationing uh, through household uh, tax or, or other means. Uh, in our system, it's kind of more of a straight ahead rationing program would be an adaptation meant to ensure that everyone has enough and that access is equitable. So in these systems, rationing is not the, the bully rationing is your friend. It's something to make you know, society uh, more fair and, um, and ensure sufficiency. Um, so how, how would I um, see this working and how, how to adapt um, society um, uh, to the cap beyond just the rationing. Um, well, in, in affluent high emitting countries like the US and the UK, uh, sufficiently, sufficiently rapid phase out of fossil fuels or either straight ahead or through carbon would leave us facing a diminished energy supply. The federal government would need to make sure the economy is able under those circumstances to satisfy basic needs. Um, I, I believe that is going to require a comprehensive industrial policy that directs energy and other resources toward the production of essential goods and services and away from uh, wasteful and unnecessary production. Um, such policies, for example, uh, could divert resources, say, away from military production toward development of uh, green infrastructure, retrofitting buildings, or away from aircraft and private vehicles toward public transportation, away from construction of McMansions toward affordable, energy efficient, durable housing, or from production of feed grain for cattle toward grains and legumes for food and overall uh, away from luxury goods to basic necessities. And uh, then and if, you know, if we're un under one of these systems and the consumer's energy market, the um, household market, uh, the two, there are two requirements um, that, that I think would ensure that all households have sufficient, and elec uh, sufficient electricity and fuel access. Um, and one would be uh, price controls because the cap is going to raise ener energy prices. Uh, and then that backed up by the uh, fair shares rationing system. Uh, as um, when there were tight supplies of uh, fuels in the UK and US during World War II, uh, both, it required both price controls and, and rationing. But even price controls and rationing alone would not be enough to overcome the economic injustice and huge disparities in access to material resources uh, within the US or within the UK, let alone among the world's nations. So another domestic policy, and one that I, I think I've read, Sean, that you've been advocating for is universal basic services, which would guarantee uh, every household sufficient access to essential goods and services, including such things as public water and energy supplies, um, health services, public education and transportation, good quality food, good affordable housing, green space, clean air, public safety with, without repression. And not meaning that it, everything would be free, but there would be some guarantee that people, no matter what their income, would um, have access. Uh, 
Now, many, maybe a majority of people in these systems might end, actually end up materially and socially better off in that kind of a country. Um, but um, you might ask, could all of this be feasible? Uh, and I kind of think of it this way, because all production requires energy, then the focusing um, uh, fo focusing of energy supplies on essential goods and services will mean that wasteful solely for profit production is going to be starved of energy and that will free up lots of uh, money, labor, other resources that would have gone into unneeded production that can be used in, instead for meeting universal needs. And uh, as uh, as Sean alluded to, um, under this, um, in any of these systems, growth for growth's sake uh, will be necessarily sacrificed. And so I'll, um, uh, in, on that, I'll end um, by quoting none other than uh, John Pfeffer, who wrote recently in his excellent article called From the Unsustainable Here to the Sustainable There, uh, quote, uh, only when a critical mass of people understand that the pie can't keep growing, that unlimited growth is not liberating, but ultimately self-defeating, will a tipping point in public opinion be reached. And so I think that's um, uh, that, that's what we've got to work for, among among uh, other things. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Stan. Go ahead, Sean, and. Uh... Look forward to your comments to Stan's comments. You want to go first, Yvonne? Sorry? I, I wondered whether Yvonne would like to go first. Yeah, you... Would, would you like to make some comments on what Stan has just said? Mm, no, <laughs> not particularly. <laughs> I, I could add one thing that I, I um, forgot to say. Um, is that um, this, of, you know, we, we're talking about uh, national governments and uh, uh, domestic societies doing these things. There are some good efforts at trying to figure out systems for um, reducing emissions and fossil fuel use and, and emissions globally in a way that um, is, is fair and transfers resources from the global north to, to the south in uh, some fairly uh, in, inventive ways. There's a, a group, uh, they're based in Ireland, but the, the group is around, around the world, FESTA, um, F-E-A-S-T-A. There's uh, the Climate Action Network who has um, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Egypt at COP27, they were um, advocating for another um, uh, good plan to do this. And then there is the movement for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which also has um, uh, climate justice provisions uh, built into it. Maybe. Hey, Yvonne, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, let me. Yeah. Maybe to to say that um, since um, decades ago, um, movements of uh, indigenous peoples, campesinos, fishermen, fisherwomen, have been fighting against climate change, and how they do not talk about. Um, CO2 emissions or carbon or reductions. Uh, they just uh, want to stop oil, gas, and coal extraction. So I think that um, uh, this, uh, I don't know how to relate with the tax proposals and with, uh, you know, all of, of all, all of these um, um, commitment and, com and and desire of the of the sittings and in the world that these texts are being taken in place, but this also should be related in a certain way. I don't know how. <laughs> Recognizing that there are other people doing also these efforts, 
Because it's not a question that the, that the citizen in the UK say, I am, go, I am doing this effort and paying a little bit more, neither paying, just redeeming what the government is or giving me for free, but other people is doing also an effort elsewhere. So I think that this campaign or these proposals should be always linked, visibilizing what other peoples are doing in the world. And uh, yeah, for example, in Ecuador, there are so many communities here that are resisting the oil extraction and being criminalized because of this, not giving free entitlements of nothing, <laughs> but giving, I don't know, try, they are putting in jail. So I think that we have to, to, to include this discussion also when we talk about this text. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, can I say a couple of go quick ahead, things, Jack, before we go to the Q&A, because I'd like to do that. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, so I just wanted, uh, I'll respond to Stan first and then Yvonne. Um, so I just wanted to sort of echo really what Stan has said, um, really echo that um, the similar system that Stan talked about, just, you know, all the things I spoke about earlier in terms of paradigm shifts, et cetera, absolutely apply as well to that, and that we're very much, um, you know, on the same team. Um, and, you know, I'm a great supporter of Stan's work, I'm very grateful for it. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to add um, to uh, what Stan said, one slide that I didn't share, just because I was aware of um, running over time. Um, which is this one around um, rationing, um, because I think it's it's a word that um, you know some people say the the only the only thing less popular than the concept of rationing is the concept of taxation, and that these are the these are the only two things that we're that we're debating. Um, and I, I think the word rationing, as it says here on this slide, it contains two kind of popular meanings, kind of intertwined in a way that's often not examined and one is this sense of this welcome sense of, of guaranteed shares for people in in times of crisis you know people would much rather have a ration than have no ration um but it also contains this sense of of limits you know limits on what on what you can consume which you know is 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 often unwelcome um and i think that's really the the essence of um why it's so critical to what Yvonne's saying. It's about limiting consumption in the global north. And I think there's probably been some confusion when I've talked about the, the free entitlements to people as though as though it's saying, um, you know, go ahead and, and freely burn more. Actually, what it's doing is implementing a, a cap on what they can consume. Because at the moment, people effectively have a, a free tax entitlement to buy as much as they can afford. And, and what we're saying is, no, let's limit that. Let's make it so that you can't just buy as much energy and earn as much energy as you can afford. Um, as, as Stan and many others have pointed out, the system that we have today is essentially, you might call it rationing by wealth. Um, you know, there's, there's only so much of something available, well, the rich just get it. Uh, that's the system that we've got now. Um, and really what we're talking about is moving, burn is what you can afford. Uh, and moving to a system where um, your ability to consume energy is limited, not just by what you can afford. Um, and uh, and then again, I, I, I really just want to echo what Yvonne said. I think that um, in many ways, the whole conversation around reducing emissions in the global north is sick to the core. Um, I think it's based on completely misguided paradigms. I think that um, indigenous resistance is absolutely where the wisdom is to be found on this, and it's where the insight is to be found on this. Um, and I myself have been arrested um, in trying to shut down um, fossil fuel extraction sites and um, was involved in, it was one of the first arrestees with Extinction Rebellion, for example. Um, you know, I'm, I'm part of that, of that movement, and I, I think that what text is, is an attempt to translate some of the wisdom of restraint and absolute limits into the language of a Sikh empire, frankly. Um, and I'm sure that in doing that, um, it's taken on some of the sickness. Um, and so, you know, I would share with Yvonne a sense that, you know, I 
live in a small community in Ireland where we have um, moved away from money. We run a free pub where people can come and stay for free and eat for free. We grow our own food. You know, we're, we're very much grounded in um, the older, wiser cultures on our planet um, and trying to um, trying to learn some of that wisdom from the unfortunate disadvantaged state that I have of being born into England, which is a sick culture, which is destroying everything on the planet. Um, and what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, um, yeah, offer some sanity to the madness. And so I can completely understand why Yvonne, having been born into a more sane culture, might find it hard to even wrap her head around some of the insane concepts that we're talking about, because they are insane. Um, like this is this is an attempt from within a an omnicidal culture to limit some of the damage that it's doing. And I just echo what Yvonne's saying that if you really want to hear someone wise talking about it, talk to the indigenous activists. Amen to that. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'd like to pose the first question, and, it, and it's to all to each of you. Um, so it seems to me that. Moving away from fossil fuel is obviously critically important. The more quickly we can do that, the better. But we also have to recognize how disruptive that is going to be. It's going to be very disruptive. There's no way around not being disruptive. So the question becomes, how do we deal with that disruption? The question I have for each of you is, what is your sense of how the degrowth movement and make a contribution to um, living well with less. Because the degrowth movement is not only about reducing economic activity for, especially for the unnecessary things that Stan talked about, uh, but also providing the kind of supports that are, seem to me to be essential for any kind of transition and, and uh, embracing disruption the way we need to. I'd be very interested in your perspective and comments on uh, degrowth, especially obviously in, in the North and for wealthy, wealthy people in any nation. Would any of you like to comment on that? We, we collect some of the questions or we answer one by one? Well, uh, we can... Uh, mm -hmm. One by one. Go ahead, Ivan. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I would like to mention something about the degrowth movement. Uh, I have been talking about this uh, since many years with some European friends and here in America Latina too, in Ecuador. And I think that the degrowth movement is not really uh, a movement that uh, first of all, can be understand or fit in, in the global South, at least in Ecuador. Because how can we ask the indigenous people to degrowth? I mean, this is completely absurd. <laughs> but I, I rather, uh, instead to talk about degrowth, I like to talk about post-growth. Because, yeah, we have to, to put aside always the concept of growth of the economy, the progress and development, all of these concepts that are completely capitalistic and neoliberal, etc. Yeah, so the, the growth movement could be an ally. I don't see that, no, of course, but we have to understand that this is something that should be discussed in Northern countries, in Europe, etc. but it's not necessarily a concept that fits complete in, in, in the, global South demands. And also I would like to add about this idea of living well or summa causa, that is the, the Quichua concept here in, in Ecuador. Uh, and, and also has to do a little bit of, uh, I would like to make a comment of uh, uh, Sean's presentation and the text. I think that text is too much oriented in an anthropocentric uh, point of view. Because it's, 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 a, it's a carbon budget is regarding humans. And, uh, and consume is energy is regarding humans. But also, I think that it would be good to in, incorporate in the, in the text proposals and debate, et cetera, 
uh, the point of view of the non-humans, other beings, including the stones <laughs> and the spirits. <laughs> so I think that it, this would be very, very good to, to include in the text discussion. No? Jack, yeah, I think the um, degrowth movement centered mainly in Europe, but they they have been um, very valuable in kind of envisioning uh, what a, a degrowth society or post growth society would um, would look like, and and you know, pointing out the the differences between economic growth and you know, growth of uh, human well-being. Um, and they, um, I think, uh, purposely it have not uh, gotten into mechanisms to achieve uh, uh, a degrowth. Um, and so I, um, I've you know, been, you know, followed them a lot uh, and I'd say probably I'm a, a degrowther, uh, but um, I've taken the um, um, the route of um, describing what it, it appears to me and, and to others, um, and, and uh, most of y'all, I'm sure, that um, th there has to be rapid, immediate. Um, phase out of fossil fuels and end to um, uh, the general ecological destruction. And, um, and there are ways that it could be done. It probably won't be done because uh, it will, uh, it would uh, affect and, and, and end growth quite quickly and, and it would go into degrowth. Uh, and there would be no capitalism. Um, and so for those reasons, it's uh, being objected to. But I, I think it's important for society to see that they, they have to choose between growth or, or survival. And that if we do what's necessary for survival, we won't have growth. And that that would not be bad, that we could, in the affluent societies, um, be better off with less, and in, in the meantime, in the the uh, non-affluent societies, um, you know, there there are um, going to be other solutions. Yeah, de degrowth is not um, not something, as, as Yvonne said, that's not a thing that's going to work. Hey, um, we only have a minute left, Sean. I'll give you the last word, and I also apologize to other participants whose questions may not have been addressed. But we'll, uh, hopefully, this is the beginning of a, of a conversation. Go ahead, Sean, for some closing comments. Sure. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to say that I basically think Yvonne is the one talking sense here, and that there are a lot of problems with the paradigm of, of carbon budgets, and there are a lot of problems with um, the whole paradigm of, uh, 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 we, we're losing your voice, Sean. Um, we're not higher than those of us in the global north and in that view. Sean, sorry, I, uh, um, your, your you voice. Uh, your voice cut out there. Could you please repeat those comments? And then we're sure. going to have to close very shortly, I'm afraid. Sure. I, I was saying I um, I basically think Yvonne is the one talking sanity here. Um, I think that we are all trying to um, face an impossible situation. You know, we're in a situation uh, where the present is intolerable. Um, someone said that the greatest achievement of the I think they were talking about America, actually, is to learn to tolerate the intolerable. Um, and we're all trying to figure out how to move towards something more sane. I think that Yvonne's right, that it's indigenous cultures that, that have that sanity. Um, I think that Yvonne is right, that the, all of this conversation has been vastly too anthropocentric and that we should be listening to other voices. Um, and 
I would go back to David Fleming, who invented text, his wider words on the context of growth. Um, and he said, really, the task is not properly specified in terms of either the growth or the degrowth of the market economy. It's about the growth of its sequel and indeed its predecessor, the, the informal non-monetary economy. Um, it's about getting ready for the moment where this system collapses under the weight of its own unsustainability. We have inherited a system that depends on growth. That growth will end by accident or design and soon. Probably growth will go into reverse without the need for any assistance and more decisively than any zero or negative growth program could accomplish. Whatever the cause, the system that develops without it will not be a revision of what we have now. It will be a complete rewrite. And my understanding is that um, after this system fades into history, um, future systems will again be based on informal relationships between beings on the planet and on ecology, just like they always have been in the past before this few centuries of madness. And it's the older cultures on our planet that know how to live in that world. And we should absolutely be listening to them more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So John, we'll leave it to you for the last word. And I'd just like to personally thank each of the participants. It's been a really useful and informative discussion. Thank you, Jack. And, and I'll echo you in thanking everyone. Uh, you, of course, think this is the end, the end of our session. But in fact, this is the beginning because you have raised some really important questions, some really important challenges. And we want to take this forward in thinking about programmatically how we can integrate your insights and take this one step forward in terms of action, not just in terms of discussion. So we'll be in touch with all of the panelists. And of course, we'll also be in touch with all of you who've been in the audience about how you can play a role in this as well. So thank you again for, for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you're interested in continuing to find out about uh, the work of Global Just Transition or any of the work of uh, the panelists who in their own uh, countries and in their own organizations are doing incredible work, please sign up and uh, at the Global Just Transition site that we put in the chat way up at the beginning, and we'll be back in touch with you very soon. So wherever you are and in whatever time of day you have left to you, please enjoy the rest of it, and we'll see you later.